Hey folks, good morning. It's Jared here. Uh, lovely to see you. So what I'm going to do is show you a film which I made around the South Bank, not too far from the National Theatre and the Old Vic. It was a tour called The World of Laurence Olivier and I did it for a great company called Hago and now I'm premiering it here on YouTube. So just to explain, there'll be a uh, on the video, me replying to a few questions on the chat. So when I did this tour live, and this is a rerun of that tour, there were people typing in questions. So hopefully the questions, quite a few of them I'll repeat, and uh, a few of them I may not repeat. So there may be a slight bit of confusion on the tour, but hopefully we can all enjoy this together. And this is the world of Laurence Olivier. If we're in the Waterloo Memorial Garden, you can see the London Eye this was marshland many years ago. Lambeth marshes. So in this garden, they have many insects. A lot of school kids come here and they learn about the importance of marshland and wetland. These amazing insect sculptures. This is one of my favourites. So the kids love it. They get terrified at these things. But this was old Lambeth marshes. And the reason we're on this side of the river and we're talking about Laurence Olivier in this area is because we're very close to the Old Vic. In fact, we're across the road. The Old Vic opened as the Royal Coburg Theatre in 1818 and on our walk our chat we'll talk about Olivier and his link to the old Vic. Now originally this was outside the West End obviously on the other side of the river from Covent Garden and Piccadilly it was a venue for entertainments not plays melodramas burletters which were plays with music and variety. It wasn't given a license for theatre, for straight drama and comedy. Only two places did, and they were in Lincoln's Inn, and the other one was the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. The building poking out on the left-hand side is One Blackfriars, which is right next to the Tate Modern. So further in that direction, you've got the Tate Modern, and just beyond that, the Globe. It took a couple of years to build. Kept running out of money, designed by a man called Rudolf Cabanel. And it cost a fortune, £12,000. And they do say, though it's not been proved, that a lot of the building material is said to have been recycled from the old Savoy Palace, which was on the Strand. In the 1820s, it started to put on regular plays. In 1833, it was renamed the Royal Victoria Theatre, then the Royal Victoria Hall and Coffee Tavern. In 1912, we had the first Shakespeare season here, and by 1918, it was the only permanent Shakespearean theatre in London. That was 1918. By 1923, all of William Shakespeare's plays, at that point, 36 of them had been performed here. And it grew in stature in the 20s and 30s. One of the managers, one of the famous managers, was a man named Tyrone Guthrie. He eventually went off to Canada and started the Stratford Shakespeare Festival in Ontario. There's the old Vic. I love the painting on the outside of it. It looks like I've just literally superimposed that on. It's just opened with Eureka Day, starring Helen Hunt. About the parents of high school kids. It's a political comedy. But the reason we're showing you this because Laurence Olivier worked here. This is where he started. 
what we now know of as the National Theatre. So back to his life, he was born 1907 in Dorking, in Surrey. His family were a long line of, on the male side, vicars and priests. His father, incidentally, was called Gerard. What a great name. His father actually considered a career in theatre before he eventually became an Anglican priest. Helen has asked, why is the street named The Cut? So, we've got one road, Waterloo Road, which goes along the river, and this cuts through. So it was literally a cut. It holds about 1800 now. They've done some interesting things at the Old Vic, especially in the last few years. I've seen productions of The Crucible, where it's been completely in the round. And every Christmas for the last five years, barring COVID restrictions, when everything was locked down, they've done a Christmas carol. So the lobby, the foyer, has been made out to look like a Dickensian market. So it can range from about 12, 1300 to about 1800, depending on the size of the stage and the setting. They can do a lot with the old bit. Now with Olivier, church was a huge part of his life. Obviously he had to go with his father being a vicar. When his father led the congregation in church, well, he was a performer as well. What interested Lawrence, a young Lawrence, was not so much what his father was saying, but how he kept the attention of the people who sat in front of him. But Lawrence always felt that there was a distance between him and his father. It seems years later in interviews that he always felt, because he had an older brother, an older sister, he always felt like he was just an extra mouth to feed. Hey Mark, good to see you. He went to the All Saints Choir School. It was a boarding school, so kept away from the family. Began to perform in Shakespeare's productions. In his younger days, he performed in many of the female roles. And he said years later, that's how he got to be maybe such a celebrated actor, because he got to play the male roles, and as a kid, the female roles. So he said he got in touch more with his sensitive side. And he was still a young boy, he was only 11 years old. It's 1920, he discovered that his mother, Agnes, was suffering from a brain tumour. And whereas his father, Gerard, was cold to him, Agnes doted upon him, made him the favourite of the family. And it was devastating to young Lawrence when she passed away when he was just 12 years old. He graduated as a young child from All Saints and then went to St Edward's School, still down in Surrey, seemed to focus on acting a bit more, little else. Seems later on when we talk about his later life and his relationships, when anything affected him, he threw himself into acting. His father still seemed to have a pretty troubled relationship with him, maybe jealousy, with just how close Lawrence was with his mother. Interestingly, his older sister, Sybil, was a student at a drama school, the Central School, Speech and Drama, still exists. And for whatever reason, Lawrence's father said he was happy for him to go, but then he reneged on his happiness by saying financially he wasn't going to help him. Acting would have been a scandalous career, especially if you were from a religious background. And especially, I suppose, if you had a father 
that felt at one point in his life that he wanted to be an actor. They may have caused, that may have caused a bit of friction between the two of them. So this idea of Lawrence going to drama school, the father said, well, I'm not helping financially. The reason we've stopped here, by the way, is this is the young Vic. This opened in the 1970s. Now it's under the direction of Kwame Kwe Arma. It's, it's been seen for many years as a, a kind of paperback version of the old Vic. So imagine buying a hardback book. You have to spend a fortune. Here, you don't have to spend as much. It's like a paperback version. Cheaper to get into. A bit more experimental. At the moment, they've got a play called Who Killed My Father? Directed, adapted and translated by Ivo Van Hove. And they've got a Mandela show coming up as well. It's one of the great hidden venues in the West End. So you had the young Vic. And originally, this was more or less a children's theatre for young people in the 1950s. And then the young Vic closed. And the old Vic, as it was then known, Ralph Richardson, a great Shakespearean actor, and Laurence Olivier started to work there. They basically started their own national theatre. So you had these two theatres, which we don't often see on these tours. So we're on an area, a road called the Cut. So if we took a right from here, we're going down to the riverbank, but I wanted us to see both of these. We'll get back to Olivier's life in a bit, his personal life, which was very interesting. But in the 1960s, at the Old Vic, Olivier started a national theatre. He always wanted a new home for it, though, not just an old theatre that would house Shakespeare plays, but a theatre that would house studio performances. They would maybe have more performance spaces, rehearsal rooms. He felt that it needed a complex of its own. Elena said, is Wednesday a matinee day as it is in NYC? It was pre-COVID restrictions, and now it seems like Thursday is more the matinee day. So on Thursday, they have a Eureka Day matinee at the Old Vic and a Sunday performance, and they're closed on the Monday. And that's just happened quite recently, actually. Just in the last year or so, most shows, and it's probably because of traffic restrictions, people can park a bit more easily. You still have to pay a congestion charge to drive in. You have to pay about £15 to come into town. And a lot of these parking spots on a Sunday are free. And when his father said, I'm not helping you go to theatre school, well, Lawrence felt a bit sad, but luckily in those days, male actors they were crying out for. There weren't as many and he got a scholarship. Now I went to drama school, we're talking 24 years or so ago. I had to pay for it. I'd been to university, I got into drama school and I had to save and save for another year. So I couldn't go the first year I wanted to. I had to save for a year and do three or four different jobs until I could afford to go. You didn't get a grant or a scholarship. There was another reason the Lawrence could afford it. They had something called repertory theatre, which was very popular. Regional theatres. They were always looking for students to play small parts in plays when they had their breaks in the studies. The union laws weren't as strict, so they would often get students to just perform and not pay them as much play small parts in Shakespeare plays. And it was during one of these semester term breaks that Olivier met 
and the actress, Jill Esmond. They appeared in a play together and they fell in love very quickly. Or at least Olivier did. After three weeks, he proposed. She said no. And then she took off to Broadway to play a part in a play and he followed her there. He was there to act, of course, but also, mainly, probably, he wanted to follow her. He was 21 years old. He was seemingly desperate to get married, for whatever reason. He wanted to get married so young. And he kept trying to persuade her. Esmond worked a good bit. Olivier didn't work that much. He came back and he waited for her to finish her work. And then he found out tragically his sister, who was recently married and a new mother, was going through some health problems, mental health problems. He kind of changed his life again. His mother passing away when he was 12, his sister going through all of these issues when he was only 21. He wrote to Esmond. They were going out together, they were courting. And he said that Sybil, his sister, had been committed to an institution to help her. And Esmond wrote back and said that she couldn't help. After a few months, she said, I'm coming back to you. She did stop off for a beach vacation on the way. So already, before they even married, it was a bit of an issue. This is Waterloo Station. We'll come round to the front of this in a moment. I'll tell you a bit more about it. But in June 1930, Olivier and Jill Esmond married. It had been two years they had been apart. Still a couple, but living in different countries, so it was a big change in their lives, like a long-distance relationship, and they either decided we break up or we get married and live together. And they lived together, but it wasn't easy. Olivier threw himself into work, got a few small West End jobs. It wasn't famous, though. And then a man named Noel Coward, a writer, a very celebrated character in London, on and off stage, saw Olivier playing a very small part in a play, and he cast him in a new show, Private Lives. And it became Olivier's big break. They became very close friends. Some would say more than close, but for another tour. Then it was agreed to take the play Private Lives to New York. They needed to find a new leading lady. The leading lady in the West End decided that she didn't want to go. And conveniently, they took Jill Esmond. Now in London, the critics adored Olivia. And in the US, they adored Jill. And Esmond got big offers from film studios. In London, she was making about eight pounds a week. And Fox Studios in Hollywood said for one year, they would pay her 875 dollars a week. So you do it, really. And she was a bit reluctant to go. But then Olivier managed to bag a similar offer, and the two of them decided for one year we'll go to Hollywood and we'll work. And immediately, these two Brits, these exotic figures from Surrey, from London, 
became celebrities. They were hanging out with Joan Crawford, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. But the films flopped. Every bit that they did, every small part, every big part, they weren't as celebrated professionally as they were socially. So they went back to London. And then, like most actors' lives, by the way, this is St. John the Baptist Church in Waterloo. Oh, Helen, what a question. And I wish I knew. Tiny, tiny, small parts, no leading roles. Yeah, 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 you should be sorry. You should. I knew everything but the films that they starred in. I think Helen's a secret shopper. What films were they in? How old were they? What were their shoe sizes? You know what? You're right, though. I should know. Thanks, Debs. Easy to look it up, but may not be available. Yeah, I could have looked it up, but... Right at this moment. I could have, I could have lied. But I realised early on, someone will always catch you out. I should have just waited until Deb said that. And I said, yeah, no funny business. That was the one. Now, Hollywood called again by the way. So they kept coming back and forth and then Hollywood called again for Olivier. They needed a male lead to star opposite Greta Garbo. It's in a film, and I do know the name of this film, Queen Christina, and Olivier seemed perfect for the part. After a couple of weeks filming, Garbo said there was no chemistry between them and replaced Olivier with her ex-love, John Gilbert. Again, Olivier came back to the UK and he thought, well, this is, this is the second time this has happened. I'm going to concentrate on the London stage. And that's what he did for a good few years. Simone has said, Hamlet is my favourite. Hamlet is wonderful. Wouldn't it have been great to see it on stage back in the old days? And that's widely known these days that both of them had affairs. But even so, Jill Esmond got pregnant, late 1935. They had a son together. But after the birth of the son, it seemed, it seemed like the damage had already been done. It spent too long apart. They had dalliances with other people. Well, how do you go back to it? This is the IMAX cinema, by the way, opened in May 1999. Largest screen in the country, 21 or 27 yards. At the moment, they're advertising Prime Videos, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, a new series, which has just begun most expensive TV show ever made. So many buses, Nola. Too many for my liking. And you've got in the distance over there. Let's try and zoom in on this. This is no longer the Waterloo Hospital for Children and Women now part of King's College, some of their dormitory rooms. Yeah, I chose a good time, rush hour. If it works now, this tour, it'll work at any time. You don't see this often in London. You see KFC quite a lot. But you very, very rarely see Kentucky Fried Chicken. The actual full words. 
Richard the Third, wonderful Henry the Fifth. You've got all of these structures, train stations, modern buildings, and right in the center of it. We need to see this. We need to appreciate this. A small house, a listed protected structure, a little square building in the middle of everything. And it's a residential property. I don't know how busy that is at night outside. They don't have real grass, they have astroturf, fake grass. I can totally understand. I'm just approaching Waterloo Station. The signal should keep, but I'm just going to cut through under one of these arches. Waterloo Station is the busiest and largest station in the UK. Opened in 1848, slightly rebuilt in 1853. Elaine likes Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca was amazing. That brooding work that he does in that. Rebecca is a stunning piece of work. The Waterloo Station used to house the Necropolis Company, designed to accommodate mourners, hold funeral services before coffins were then transported to Brookwood Cemetery. And this is known as the Victory Arch. They have plaques on either side that commemorate those killed in conflict. The last station to use steam regularly until 1967 was where the original Eurostar was, and then that moved to St Pancras. Now, goodness knows what the signal will be like. It's not part of this tour, but I fancy, I fancy we should go in because there is a beautiful new sculpture. It's not that old at all. And it commemorates all the people that came from the Caribbean, the Caribbean, to work in the UK from the late 40s to the early 70s, the Windrush generation. I'd like us just to have a quick look at the sculpture if the signal stays. 1848, rebuilt in the 1850s. Again, like a lot of places in this area, a lot of the train tracks and train stations quite heavily bombed during the Blitz. So the station inside is modern steel and glass. This is the old Eurostar terminal. So anyone that came on the Eurostar 15 years ago or so would have come to one of these terminals, these platforms. There are 24 platforms at Waterloo. They're the largest and the busiest. I'm actually amazed that we've got a signal in here at rush hour. I'm really happy about it. The railway children was on here in 2011 and they set it all on a train track. So when the Eurostar moved to St. Pancras, these weren't used. And they had audience seats all the way around. And they had a real train that came into the station at the end. It was phenomenal. But this is what I want to show you. And it's now known as the National Windrush Monument. I'm pleased to say we still have a signal, but this is... It's a beautiful sculpture. It's husband and wife and child. And it commemorates, acknowledges, celebrates the contribution of what we now know as the Windrush generation. Basil Watson. That's it, Tony. 1848, redesigned 1853. This has been here since June. I'm just going to do a vertical shot. So to apologise the way the camera goes. So they're stood on suitcases. I've got a great poem next to it. Now I could read the poem. Oh, 
Let's read it very quickly. It's called You Called and We Came. And it goes, You called and we came. In ships bigger than anything we'd seen, dwarfing our islands and covering them in the shadows of smoke and noise. Crowded, excited voices filled the air, traveling to the motherland. Driven by a wish, a call to save, to rebuild, to support efforts to establish health for all in the aftermath of the war. You called and we came. A new millennium. New hopes spread across this land, new populations engaging and reflecting the very diverse vibrant nature of these shores. Challenging and reflecting on leadership for health moves to melt the snow of the peaks of our profession. Recognizing the richness of our kaleidoscope nation where compassion, courage and diversity are reflected in our presence and our contribution. Not only the hopes and dreams of our ancestors, human values needed to truly lead change and add value. Remember you called. Remember you called. You called. And remember it was us who came. That's it by Professor Laura Salon, OBE, PhD, Queen's Nurse. I thought, why not? It wasn't part of the tour, but I think it needed reading. Uh, thank you, Brian. I got a bit nervous there. People were walking in front of me, and I thought, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to see the poem. I will admit, I didn't read, uh, I didn't memorize that poem. I read it. I just didn't show it. That would be one heck of a tour. If I remembered a poem just just off the cuff. And Olivier in his life, well, going back to him, with all these troubles he had, he threw himself into work. Look at the crowds. Isn't it wonderful? It's wonderful because they're all going home. They've got smiles on their faces. Whereas I am walking into the thick of it. This is all okay. <laughs> I, I'm actually doing the same intonation as I was in the poem. I'm, I'm doing this tour like a poem, so I apologize for that. Okay, so we're going to go back to the story. Late 1935, Esmond and Olivier. Now they're adults. We can call them by their surnames. They had a son. Tarquin. Olivier seemed to work tirelessly. Talking about learning, he famously learnt 12,000 Shakespeare lines over the course of a year. Now, if you imagine the play Hamlet, the part of it is about 17 to 1800 lines. 12,000. He learnt at least eight Shakespeare plays fully. One day, after a production of Romeo and Juliet, an actress, somebody you may have heard of, Vivian Lee, an up-and-comer, she approached him at a restaurant. And she said, congratulations on your performance. And just like with Jill, years before, he became immediately obsessed. Problem was, he was also married. Didn't stop him, didn't stop them. They were both married, but they began a passionate affair. And it was very much helped by the fact they were both cast in the same film, Fire Over England. 1937, Olivier was asked to play Hamlet at Elsinore Castle in Denmark. He suggested, quite slyly, 
that the producers cast Lee as Ophelia. Kay Emma said Gielgud called her a charming, decorative creature. <laughs> I always find it funny when men call women creatures. She's a beautiful creature. It's a very funny thing to say. So he asked the producers, and they said, yep, yeah, let's cast Lee, Vivian. But during rehearsals, it seemed that Vivian herself was, we would now say, exhibiting strange behavior. She was screaming one moment at Olivier and going silent the next. And on one occasion, it escalated. They performed that night. She was asked about it the day after and she said she couldn't remember a thing. But when they returned home from Elsinore in Denmark, Olivier and Lee they both respectively told their spouses they were leaving them. When Olivier asked Jill for a divorce, she refused, as did Lee's husband. But despite it, they lived together. And the film studios, as they did all the time, and as maybe they still do to this day, they hushed it up. Olivier went back to Hollywood, starred as Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights, and Lee was cast in the very small, intimate drama named Gone with the Wind. Helen G has said bipolar. That's what we would say now. That's what she was. After finishing Wuthering Heights, he went around the States, touring in different plays. And then he suddenly found out his father had died suddenly of a stroke. Olivier was stuck in Indianapolis. He couldn't get back for the funeral. So again, this tragedy and this sadness, this melancholy life that he had led, it continued. On one side happy, on one side passionate, and another corner of his life was tragic. And then this bittersweet letter arrived from Jill Esmond's mother. And she wrote and said, Jill would agree to the divorce and that Jill would also attend the father's funeral in Lawrence's absence. Then another tragedy, averted, it seems, maybe being separated, affected the two of them, but one night, like Bibby and Lee accidentally overdosed on sleeping pills, she was revived by a maid in the middle of the night. And Olivier was due to star in Rebecca and Pride and Prejudice, back-to-back -back films. And he wanted to have Vivian cast in both of them. The studios rejected the idea. On one hand, I suppose if they were still married to other people, it wouldn't look good. But maybe their fractious relationship, which was already showing the tears and the cracks, they just knew it might be a difficult rehearsal and filming period. This is, again, like with Jill, before they got married. But in 1940, they got their divorces. They did marry in Santa Barbara and they ended a three year secret affair. Then we move on to World War II. Olivier felt the need to help in some way. He tried to get his pilot's license. He spent hours and hours training and the government told English actors to stay in Hollywood and make pictures that I suppose would portray the country in a positive light. 
So that's what he did. And then Lawrence and Vivian got together with Alexander Corder to make a film called That Hamilton Woman. And it had been the first film together since their marriage. The cracks were appearing. Drinking, arguments. But Olivier had a new passion. Making speeches. Trying to maybe show Britain in a positive light. And a lot of theatres were closing during the war and Olivier and Ralph Richardson, they wanted to keep the old theater on this side of the river, the old Vic, going. They wanted it to boost morale. That's a good question. Helen said, was Jill more independent and Vivian more needy? It's a tricky one to answer, isn't it? It seemed that Lawrence himself wanted the passion. He fell in love very quickly with two ambitious actresses. I don't know. He wasn't perfect. Neither were they. But it seemed later in his life, he wanted a bit of peace and quiet. So Richardson and Olivier, they, they kept the old Vic going. Olivier said years later that the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force, he wanted to work for the army. He wanted to do something for the war effort. And they said, no, go straight back, make films. And he said, hmm, their enthusiasm was positively hurtful. 1947, the fourth year at the Old Vic, George VI knighted Olivier, made him the youngest actor to become a sir. Then he starred, directed, produced, adapted Hamlet, which won Best Picture and Best Actor Oscars. He took the old Vic Company on a six-month tour of Australia and New Zealand. That was 1948. And that, years later, is when Olivier said, I lost Vivian. Vivian Lee began an affair with an actor named Peter Finch. And to add insult to injury, Olivier had actually just hired Finch for his production company and gave him a really good contract. And it was around this time, medically, that Vivian Lee was diagnosed with what was then called manic depression and now called bipolar disorder. This is the National Theatre. Beautiful blue sky. I was worried. It's all happened fortuitously. When I did my Alfred Hitchcock tour a couple of weeks ago, it was my first World of Tours. And it was so wet that I think even some of the voyagers watching got soaked. Hi, Ellie. Thank you, Paul. Vivian tried to hide what she was going through. She made a movie abroad in 1953 with Peter Finch. She told Olivier she was in love. She wanted a divorce, but it never happened. She got more and more ill. The decision was made, family decision, to treat her in an institution for a few months. 1956, she was 44 years old. She became pregnant, sadly had a miscarriage, and it seems like she fell into a spiral of depression. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Pam. Now, affairs, when people have them, I suppose they can often be volatile, passionate, filled with drama. Sometimes what people want, I suppose. But then on a play, Olivier 
met an actress named Joan Plowright. They met while working together, and it was the complete opposite. They were calm. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Gail. It was a bit of a fruity situation. He was 22 years older, and in the play, she was playing his daughter. Make of that what you will. And the news broke about Lee and Lawrence's divorce, and Lee thought, I'm going to get my own back here, and she told the press about the other woman. But despite all of this, they continued to be close. They continued to write to each other. They still cared for each other. Now, I'm showing you Lord Laurence Olivier, the only actor to become a lord. This is him as Hamlet. In the 1970s, the National Theatre, he had started the National Theatre, the organisation at a new building, but they asked Peter Hall instead. Thank you, Helen. And this is our modern National Theatre. Influenced by the designs of a Swiss-French architect, Le Corbusier. And it's not brutalist, even though it is concrete. It was built with wooden planks and the concrete was filled in. So the actual look of it from here might look like brutalist concrete. But if you went up really close and inside, they're literally like concrete planks. In July of 1967, by the way, Vivian passed away. She had a battle with tuberculosis. Her partner, John Merivale, was the man who discovered her body. The first person he called was Laurence Olivier. Even though they broke up seven years earlier, he rushed to see her one last time and he insisted on staying with her body until the authorities removed it. Olivier helped organize the funeral, arranged for her to be cremated, and her ashes spread near her home in East Sussex. Did marry. They stayed very happy. He stayed in Sussex. He was made a lord. And he also became Baron Olivier of Brighton. Not a bad accolade. He took on roles maybe in his later career that possibly he wouldn't have done but he was still locking down these Oscar nominations in his 60s, even after he hit the age of 70. And finally, in 1989, Laurence Olivier passed away of kidney failure. Many of his contemporaries, many critics agree that he was the finest actor of his generation, if not any. And this is him here outside the National. Obviously, for years, there were speculations about his private life outside of the affairs, his sexuality. Some people believe he had an affair with Marlon Brando. But Joan Plowright, his wife, was asked about this many years later, and they said, oh, did he have affairs with men? And she said, if he did, so what? That was the proper answer, I think. Did he ever act in the burlesques at the Old Vic? Well, he acted in a burlesque-style play named The Entertainer in the late 1950s, early 1960s, playing Archie Rice, one of his greatest roles, and then made a film of it as well. Yeah, Danny Kaye. Yeah, there was a rumour with Danny Kaye 
and Brando and Noel Coward and Henry Ainley another actor but you know what Joan always said if he did so what the cutscene in Spartacus is another one yeah <laughs> Folks, I am going to leave you alone and leave you be outside the National Theatre. Now, the stage here is called the Olivier stage, the main stage. There's also a Dorfman stage and a Littleton. Olivier himself was not asked to be the artistic director at the National Theatre here. That was Peter Hall. And Peter Hall saw Olivier at the Old Vic and was inspired by him to take up theatre as a career, and it was Peter Hall who had started the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford that was asked to head up the National. But the stage is still named after him. Just to end, thank you, Susan, and thank you, Jennifer. I'm, I'm glad you've seen these sites. In the weeks before Olivier passed away, apparently he watched a movie that saw, that showed Vivian Lee. And uh, this is what Joan Plowright said. He, he just began to cry and he said, this, this was love. And even though their relationship didn't last forever, Lee seemed to feel the same way. And the actress once said, I would rather have lived a short life with Larry and face a long one without them, which I think is a nice way of ending. Thank you, Nola. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Simone. I am going to bring you back to me. Here I am. We stayed dry. I love doing that. Sorry it was a bit long. There was so much more I wanted to talk about. Uh, I, I thought I thought I'd have time for it. I think uh, what took us a few minutes extra was going into Waterloo Station. But I love that. I love re reading that poem, and I think that Windrush sculpture is phenomenal and a very important thing. But Olivier's life, Vivian Lee, Joan Plowright, Jill Esmond, their, their lives are fascinating. Behind us is London Pride, and that's the sculpture. I will end in front of that. Obviously, we have in the distance Waterloo Bridge. It's 25 past five. It's a lovely blue sky. Or bits of it are. That's a good one, Tish. Maybe I could do a tour on Vivian Lee. It's all fascinating. Maybe look into that. Thank you, Emmy. Hey, Satyam. Yeah, it's a good idea, isn't it? I don't like to forget these people. Like when I talked about Alfred Hitchcock, I spoke almost as much about Alma, his wife. This is by Frank Dobson, London Pride. Until 1963. It was originally commissioned, this sculpture, for the Festival of Britain. Now, these guys look like they're just waiting to see a show at the National. I don't know what the dress code is at the National Theatre, uh, but I reckon they might, they might say something to these guys. I wouldn't go in dressed in absolutely nothing. What did Olivier regard as his best work? I'm not 100% sure, Tish. But probably, I would say, The Entertainer. Thank you, Satyam. Thank you, Adrian. Bravo for your humour. Yeah, The Entertainer, I think, is wonderful. But Rebecca is, is wonderful as well. But you seem to have problems with both Rebecca and working on Wuthering Heights with Merle. He kept being asking, asked to refilm, And he was a theatre actor. He did his work, I suppose in film, 
It's not the actor. It's the camera needs the rehearsal more than the actor. Okay, folks. I will leave you be. Lots of love. I bet he liked Hamlet best. Oh, Denise has asked right at the end, what about his relationship with Michael Redgrave? Yeah, definitely. Look at this guy ruining the sculpture by putting this foot up. I shall leave you be. I've carried on probably a bit more than I, I should. I am probably, as per usual, cutting into someone's tours. I think it's probably Gary, I think, is on at the moment. So uh, go and watch Gary. Go and support him, the great London guide. Lots of love. Thank you for all of your comments, your interest, staying with me. Thank you for sending the good weather gods my way. Join me tomorrow. I'm doing a couple in the afternoon tomorrow. Join me for one of my ghost stories at night. I'll be doing one of those on Saturday night. They've gone very well. Very well received, which I'm, I'm surprised about. I'm really happy about. A Jared Fest tomorrow. That sounds good. A new festival, Jared Fest. Lots of love to you all. I will see you soon. Thank you for all your support. Take care.